Lean Six Sigma Student Stories. It's great to see you attending this webinar. Uh, we're going to be uh, uh, speaking to three of our previous students that we've had, and we're going to have some stories about their experiences along the way. You're, uh, you, you will be muted during this session. However, please enter in the comment section or uh, questions that you might have, and we'll try to address as many as we can throughout the session. My name is Forrest Breifogel. I'm the founder and CEO of Smarter Solutions. You may have received emails from me in the past, or maybe even phone calls from myself, uh, describing about Lean Six Sigma and process improvement and business systems in general. Uh, Again, we're glad you're attending. As you can tell from past, we really love teaching Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt and Black Belt classes. Smarter Solutions basically starts with two weeks of Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt class, followed by an additional two-week Black Belt class. You have the option of taking all four weeks together or taking Greenbelt and then at a later time finish the Black Belt training. What separates us from the rest of Six Sigma training providers is our unique approach to integrating business management with Lean Six Sigma, which we call Integrated Enterprise Excellence, or IEEE. A few students will give you answers during this webinar on what to expect in our belt classes. We have lots of exciting information to give you in a short period of time, so let me introduce our fantastic student panelists. Then we'll move on to our questions. Again, we're glad that you're attending this webinar, and we appreciate your participation by asking questions. Brian is a 2005 Smarter Solutions Black Belt student. Brian, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background with Lean Six Sigma and how you got started with Smarter Solutions? Thank you very much, Forrest. Uh, I began in the semiconductor industry where we kind of jumped into lean, kind of out of a necessity, uh, out of a need because of our explosive growth at the time. And from there we moved on to evolve, or really evolved into uh, Six Sigma, kind of out of a need for better process control. And that's kind of when I got involved with Smarter Solutions. And as I continue my career, uh, whether it's on staff or in a consulting capacity, uh, I always find a need to uh, use one of the tools or systems that I've learned through Smarter Solutions uh, since having worked in the software industry and the insurance industry and most recently in the healthcare industry. Uh, once again, having those resources and that background and the training has proved quite valuable for me uh, as I've, I've gone through the years. Okay, thank you, Brian. Vanessa. Vanessa is a 2002 Smarter Solutions Yellow Belt student and a 2014 Smarter Solutions Black Belt student. Vanessa, can you tell a little bit about yourself and your background with Lean Six Sigma and how you got started with Smarter Solutions? Sure, thank you. So I work in the healthcare field, and about three years ago, um, our organization was facing some major budget cuts, so we were asked to look at how we could um, be more efficient. So we did a lot of research and decided that Lean Six Sigma was the best approach for us. And after much more research, we decided that Smarter Solutions was the right fit for us. Um, part of that for us is because it's a local company for us. We're based in Austin. And so that they were really willing, flexible and willing to accommodate our special needs. Um, we've had. 40 yellow belt students go through the training, eight green belts, and four black belts total. Um, so we've really enjoyed our experience with Smarter Solutions so far. Great, Vanessa. Thank you very much. Sure. Daniel is a 2014 Smarter Solutions black belt student. Daniel, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background with Lean Six Sigma and how you got started with Smarter Solutions? Yeah, thank you, Forrest. Um, yeah, my name is Daniel, and uh, I started off in Corpus Christi in the aerospace industry. Uh, was the first time that I utilized uh, the Lean Six Sigma methodology. Uh, at the time, I, I wasn't aware of how to apply everything properly. Uh, and then, uh, about two years ago, 
uh, I started in the pharmaceutical industry as a Lean Six Sigma specialist. And uh, I thought I knew quite a bit about Lean Six Sigma methodology until uh, September, October, November, and December of, of uh, 2014 going through uh, the Smarter Solutions Green Belt and Black Belt training. Uh, I, I left there with more knowledge than uh, I could have ever imagined and uh, have already started using those things today. Okay, it's good. It sounds like all the various panelists are applying the methodologies that they learn to more than just doing projects, but kind of a way of life and how they look at data. At least that's what I'm, uh, I'm hearing from them and also I've heard from others. Well, my name is Forrest Breifog. I founded Smarter Solutions in uh, 92, so I've been at a long time and I've written like uh, over a dozen books that's dealing with Lean Six Sigma but also the an overall business system. So we've kind of evolved. We really have a passion about trying to help organizations not only execute Lean Six Sigma, but how they can actually go in and make a difference to their overall business system as well. OK, let's jump into some of the uh, questions that, uh, that we've put together first, and then also some questions that have been presented to us when various people signed up along the way. So I'd like to start off with a question to Daniel. How was your classroom experience? You attended recently, like you just said, in 2014. So what can you describe about the overall experience that you had? Uh, yeah, I, I really liked the, the classroom atmosphere. Uh, I've always been a more hands-on kind of person. Um, I, I, it, I, personally, I think that the classroom setting is the only way to go. Uh, I know that there's a lot of people that go through uh, the, the web-based portions, and uh, that's really great for them. But for me, I, I need that hands-on uh, approach. I need to be able to ask questions and to interact immediately with uh, the professors. Uh, and so for me, the in-class uh, setting was, was the best way to do it because we were able to go through a week and then left for about three weeks and applied some of those principles uh, here at my site and then came back for another week. And so for me, it was September, October, November, and December of 2014. And it was a week, at, at every, uh, a week out of every month and then a three-week break in, in between each one. And it gave me time to uh, grasp and take hold of the information that I learned and actually apply it at my site it, uh, through the use of uh, the tools and methodologies uh, and applying those principles to the project that I brought with me. Okay, that's great, Daniel. Appreciate that. Uh, Vanessa, now she has from a different perspective, she went through our online experience. Uh, can you describe your thoughts about taking uh, training online? Sure. Uh, for me, it was for flexibility purposes and also because um, we had a grant deadline to meet, so that the online portion was uh, the best fit for us. Um, it was great. It was good. And my instructor was always on hand to answer questions when I needed him. And he's still available to answer questions. Um, I also had the unique experience of um, I had it in class for the Yellow Belt uh, class. And I also had was able to attend uh, one day of the Black Belt session just to kind of compare and um, see if I could pick up any more knowledge. And the in-class experience was great also, but I realized that I actually picked up quite a bit on the, on the web course as well. Yes, I think uh, it's interesting. Uh, someone just asked me the question the other day relative to online versus stand-up, and I think the answer is kind of like a bimodal distribution. What is ideal for one person is not necessarily for the ideal for the other person. The online takes an awful lot of discipline, you know, because you know you got to get it done. And, and just basically what's uh, right for one person is not necessarily the best for the other. But those are great points of view. Uh, Brian, what uh, class interaction was most beneficial to you? I think the, the interesting thing about uh, is having the ability to interact with people from different industries and, or companies as well as people from your own industry or company. And so that gives you fresh perspectives. It allows you to swap ideas and, and see how, yeah, this could work over this, or how they're having the same issue or the same challenge. 
and that looking at how these tools, how they're presented to you, really uh, was an eye-opening experience of, hey, how this can be applied to what we're doing. And being able to take that back uh, in those weeks between classes and say, hey, yeah, this really does work. And so uh, opening your eyes up by having a lot of different folks in the class or, or folks from different industries, to me, I thought was probably the, the best interaction that I really had. Yes, I think that's a very good point. There's various perspectives and people have uh, different points of view. I think that's an excellent point. Hey, Daniel, how about uh, a question for you? Uh, every Six Sigma Belt student receives the IEEE or Integrated Enterprise Excellence set of books. In other words, you get more than a deck of slides. Can you speak to the benefits of the course material and, uh, and having these books? Absolutely. Um, I think where it is like uh, a lot of different uh, Lean Six Sigma training courses, you're going to get a set of binders that uh, you'll be able to take back with you. But more specifically, whenever I wanted to start uh, getting a, a further education, a black belt education, I went to our master black belt here on site and asked him, uh, where should I go to get a really good solid foundation of statistical knowledge? And quite literally, he said, well, Forrest Brayfogle wrote the book on statistical information, and so uh, he took the book off the shelf, showed it to me, and and uh, I signed up for the uh, Smarter Solutions course uh, that same year, and now I have a set of my own books here, but uh, the one that I'd like to point out the most is uh, where you do get the four binders, one for each week that goes through each one of the slides, the one that I appreciate the most is the PEG, uh, which is the uh, project execution guide that they give, the PEG. Uh, that one is one that literally sits on my desk every day. Uh, it, it walks me through step-by-step uh, step how to analyze a process, takes me through the DMAIC process from the define, the measure, the analyze, the improve, and the, and the control. Uh, and without that book, without that uh, peg that, it, that uh, they supply us with, uh, that's one thing that I'm able to take away from the course and use in my daily work uh, that, uh, quite frankly, is... is uh, invaluable to me in my in my job. Yeah, and for those that are not familiar with the PEG or the Project Execution Guy, it's somewhat of a memory jogger, but it doesn't exactly fit in your pockets. It's 8 and a half by 11. Uh, if, I did, if I shrunk it down to 8 and a half by 11, we'd have to supply a magnifying glass, I think, for you to read it. But uh, it gives you a very high level detail of the roadmaps. The other point that I think is uh, is worth mentioning is that people can purchase these book online so you don't have to go through the course so you can go in and coach other people on the various methodologies. Uh, what about you, Brian? Do you have some other thoughts relative to the material? Much like Daniel mentioned, it's having that reference material right there at your fingertips. And, and I still keep uh, some of book Forrest's books at my desk all the time just because you know this stuff having gone through the class. but being able to pull that reference out there and look at the detail, look at how this uh, is going to apply to the current challenge or project or effort that you've got going on is, is so valuable because browsing through there, you're going to run across another tool or another tool. Oh, you know what? Maybe, maybe this type of analysis would help us here. Maybe this type of approach would help us here. You know, kind of thinking outside the box or, or picking up something new and fresh perspectives on things. Uh, and so just having those available to you and, and knowing that <clears throat> you're not just had this big data dump on you through the pro, uh, course of the program, but rather you've got all this information for you to rely back on, is it, proved to be invaluable many times. Oh, good. Just an extension to you, Brian. Uh, uh, has has this material changed the way you looked at business? <clears throat> yes, it has in the sense that oftentimes, particularly when I began. It was, we've got a problem, let's go fix it. So what tools are going to work best to approach that problem? What perspectives? And that worked great. But I think one of the things that makes Smarter Solutions different is that when you take that IEEE approach, you get kind of the bigger picture of what is going on. What is it that we're really trying to uh, solve here? Uh, is, is the problem what we're looking at here, or is this, a, you know, for example, a common cause? issue or is this a special cause issue? And when you start asking these other questions about this and start looking at these, the bigger picture, particularly the 30,000 foot level, 
you, you start to ask some better questions, and, and that often drives better behaviors within our organizations uh, to kind of get to the root cause of some of the issues that we're really trying to address. Yeah, and there's kind of an open question here. We talked about this IWE methodology or integrated enterprise excellence. Uh, what's kind of your uh, definition of it? And anybody can jump on in uh, that, that might have a thought on that. Well, I'll start off by saying that in, in my perspective, this is Brian again, that um, once again, in addition to having that big picture, uh, it also allows you to kind of pull for projects. You know, in other words, it allows you to make sure that your resources are working on the right things because uh, it takes so many of the different elements that we've been taught uh, from various places, whether it's lean, whether it's theory of constraints, whether it's some of the statistical tools that you're presented. In, in looking at those, uh, you're drawing, you're picking the right tools. You're looking, you're asking the right questions. Having been exposed to the to the material, to the IWE material, uh, in a way that we haven't seen from other places. Okay, great. Yeah, that's it. Because that's one of the things I think is really important. Is a lot of times we look at how much we save through projects. However, uh, sometimes we save a hundred million dollars. Nobody can find the money. And what we really want to do is, with the out of lead approach, is we want to look at which metrics we want to pull, so the metric improvement needs pull for the right projects. And, and that's one of the things that I think is really important for our business to actually uh, uh, incorporate. So, uh, so a, kind of a Vanessa question here: How often do you use the information in class uh, uh, in your personal life? Well, I thought this question was interesting because just last week some one of the yellow belts that was recently trained stopped by my office to tell me how excited she was that she was able to 5S her closet. So I thought this was really appropriate. But our, our first um, major project in our organization after we went through this yellow belt training was a large-scale 5S project. And people would come by all the time and tell me all the different um, rooms in their house that they 5S. Um, also now we have some green belts and black belts and myself, and I go out and to a store or a restaurant, and I, I see things immediately that could be improved just in the process or how, how things are running. So it's definitely changed how I look at things. Yeah, so they also like the work life, too. How does it impact you on the work life? Every day. Um, my, um, my job is mostly project management and working with teams, so everything that I learned in in the course is affects it helps me every day, whether it be with the teams, whether it be with the projects, even if it's not necessarily a Lean Six Sigma project. Um, I use the material daily. Yes, okay. It really changes how you view the world, basically, how you look at numbers. Absolutely. You know, that's one thing that I think is important, so we just don't uh, uh, try to sometimes apply the tools that how we look at data and things like that. That's one thing I think is really important. Right. Well, this is a tougher question. This is one of them that was presented to us. Is effective sponsorship critical to project success? If so, how do you ensure it's provided? Not an easy question, I think, but any thoughts out there? I think it's critical to um, project success. Um, I, I don't think we would have made as much progress um, in our organization without support and sponsorship um, because at the end of the day that's that's who's giving the approvals and moving moving it forward so how do you use Vanessa how do you ensure it's provided you give uh, weekly reports or monthly reports how well you're doing or uh, how do you ensure that the sponsorship is continuing well uh, we're currently going to start uh, steering committee meetings, and that, those will be quarterly. And then for you know individual projects, we meet more frequently, weekly or you know once a month, just for updates and making sure that everybody's in the loop and in agreement with the project work we're working we're doing. So. Okay, we're good. Yeah, yeah, Forrest, I wouldn't mind uh, chiming in on that just a little bit in the sense that uh, I will say that executive sponsorship is wonderful but not entirely 100% necessary for a project to be successful. 
uh, you'll often run into situations where, you know, why can't management support us on this? And, and it's been my experience that on occasions you've got to, you know, kind of grab the bull by the horns and go with it. Use the tools, use the methodologies and demonstrate that success despite management's uh, lack of support necessarily. And oftentimes, you know, if, uh, by using the tools and demonstrating that success, you're going to show management, hey, this is the right path to go. And so I wouldn't discourage anyone from not wanting to look into this because they don't have management support. But rather, management oftentimes will challenge you, fix this problem, they don't care how. Here, sign me up for this. Well, do this, demonstrate the success, then you'll get the management buying, and, and, and then you can really uh, show that these, these tools and this methodology works. Yeah, that's a very good point. We got a, a point there, a question somebody brought in, the sponsorship must exist beforehand, the project manager and do something, some care and feeding in the sponsorship area. You know, that's kind of the ideal situation if you have someone at the top that's really asking for it, however that does not always occur. So what are your thoughts about that? Well, Forrest, uh, this, this is Daniel, I, I, I don't mind taking uh, a part of that if you don't mind. Uh, one of the things that I learned recently in, in uh, the Smart Solutions training was uh, making sure that you tie back the projects up to uh, the 30,000 foot level. So what that means is essentially if your program or if um, the plant that I'm a part of anyway, uh, at the beginning of, of every year or the end of the previous year, we're already starting to put together our goals as a plant and how we want to uh, accomplish those goals is not necessarily always going to be spelled out. Uh, but they, they basically say, go get this done, and, and this is our, our plant goal is to cut costs by $2.5 million next year. Well, that can be done in many different ways. And so how we approach the, uh, the projects that we do is we, do, we start by saying, this project will specifically support this plant goal. And so uh, that way it helps get the sponsorship because whenever you walk in and say, I have a project and I've already identified that this project will support our plant goal of X, then it, it makes it a little easier whenever you're going in asking for uh, that, that uh, leadership support. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, those are very good points. I really appreciate all that because I, I think that's one of the things that's really important, again, to underscore what I mentioned earlier is tie this to the business system. And I think, you know, right now it's often tied to goals, hey, I want to save this amount of money, but how can we go in and tie it to scorecards? So we, a lot of times we have people in the north wing of the building working on scorecards and the people in the south wing of the building work on process improvement and they don't talk to each other. But we need to hook it all together and that's what we like to do with the IWE system. And I think that's really important for demonstrating them the overall benefits of what we're doing. Let's move on to another topic. What are the what is the curriculum and requirements for Six Sigma belts and certification? So what this is a question that we had uh, that somebody submitted. Thoughts on that? Uh, this is Daniel. Uh, kind of the 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 process. That if I understand the, the question correctly, uh, we went through. Um, four weeks of, of training uh, spread out over four months for me specifically uh, and uh, the first two weeks we well first off we had to come in with a project uh, to the uh, Smarter Solutions group and uh, on the first couple days uh, we would review our project uh, to make sure that uh, it was something that was uh, that something that we could look at over the course of our four week uh, um, training that we were going to be a part of. Uh, after we finished the first week, uh, we had a, a basic set of tools that helped us through our define phase. From there, we went and started to look at defining the project, came back the next, uh, uh, after a month, after three weeks of break, and came back and submitted uh, our findings for the define phase. And then we started to look into measure and, and uh, where Smart Solutions really, I thought, uh, uh, grasped the idea of the demand process is really in the measure phase where it breaks it out into many different subgroups of how you measure to make sure that you've uh, established a good foundation before you go into analyzing, improving, and controlling the process. 
and those uh, happen over the next three consecutive months, one week out of every month. Uh, and then after you've completed that project, after you've completed the, the, the process, I should say, uh, over those four months, uh, then you get to stand up with Forrest and shake his hand, and he hands you a diploma for the completion of the uh, uh, classroom portion, and then you still have to complete the project and submit that uh, afterwards. Yeah, one of the things I think that it's important that, that Daniel pointed out is he is working on a real project. You know, some other providers uh, don't require a real project, but I, I think it's important that uh, for skin certification, you go through a real project that's going through the DMAIC roadmap, you know, and that's, that's conducted and facilitated and coached throughout the training. Uh, do you guys agree on that? Oh, well, I certainly have to chime in and say that you, unless you get your feet wet and your hands dirty, um, and you're not grasping this as much. But I'll tell you, if you get your feet wet and your hands dirty, you're going to embrace this stuff because you're going to really want to, 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 to make your project successful, and this is the way to do it. Yes, and the, the other thing is a lot of times people will really strive just for the certification on their forehead and try to go in using it and getting that done at the easiest way they can possibly do it, maybe just passing a test that doesn't involve any statistical methodologies or software. But the thing is, that's one way of doing it, but the thing is, or you can go in and uh, try to go through, get your, like you said, your feet wet and the hands dirty to truly uh, learn the overall methodologies. So what are your thoughts about just simple certification or really going at and, and uh, getting into the det details as part of the certification process. This is Daniel. Um, I, I would have to uh, agree completely with, with what Brian said. Uh, there's just no question in my mind that if you're not doing it on a personal level, it's not going to mean as much to you, one, and two, uh, it, it's not going to, uh, in my opinion, I don't feel like you would be able to uh, grasp everything that's being taught to you unless you're applying it in something that uh, uh, you can truly take home and show back to uh, the people that have probably put forth the capital for you to do the training uh, and show them that here's the uh, already the return on your investment, uh, a project that's going to uh, show benefit for the company. Yes, and I think that's what's really important. Uh, Rick, Rick Haynes, who works for Smarter Solutions, uh, someone was asking him about how much should I try to go in and save uh, for each master or each black belt in my organization. And he started and he wrote a blog on it looking at the internal rate of return. You know, in other words, you're looking at this deployment and comparing it to investing in capital equipment. What is your internal rate of return as opposed to coming up with an arbitrary number, savings per black belt? So that's just another way of looking at trying to look at the benefits of what you're actually accomplishing. So anyway, that was the second question that we had. The third question we had, <clears throat> what is most misunderstood about Lean Six Sigma benefits? Thoughts on that? This is Brian, and um, one of the things that I've run across uh, out there is that oftentimes Lean Six Sigma is overlooked. Uh, for one of two reasons. It's, it's either um, because people view it as being too complicated, it's too complex for them to grasp. You know, senior management doesn't want to have to understand statistics to be able to do this. Uh, or uh, it's a case of, well, we've already done that. We already did a Six Sigma project, and you know, or, or it wasn't like that. Uh, it, it, so to me, I think it's often overlooked or misunderstood as being uh, either an overwhelming or over-demanding uh, process. Uh, when in fact, if you choose your projects properly and if you're understanding your metrics properly, uh, this is the way you embrace this and how you run your business. Yeah, very good point. Any other thoughts on that? Uh, this is Daniel. Um, one of the things that, that we look at, uh, if 
if you don't follow the process all the way through, uh, you're, you're bound and determined to come up with mistakes that you're going to have to wind up correcting later. Uh, I can tell you that there's been too many times whenever we didn't follow the process of, of truly doing a DMAIC process or truly using Lean Six Sigma where we're now looking back and trying to fix a problem that we were addressing two years ago. And it becomes basically the the annual look back at the same problem and, and we try to address it again and again. And uh, where in the past we've either tried to throw money at the problem or tried to throw people at the problem. Uh, and what Lean Six Sigma uh, teaches us is there's a structured approach to problem solving. And that gets down to the true root cause of the issue. And, and until you can actually fix the root cause of the problem, you're going to wind up trying to uh, figure out a better way uh, to do the same problem again. OK, excellent point. I think we mentioned also the 30,000 foot level uh, metrics reporting. And uh, for those that are familiar with Smarter Solutions, you perhaps are familiar with what was meant with that. We, we train that within the organization. But it's a high level of view of the output of an overall process. And that's what I, we think is really important here, is to look at what metric you're really trying to improve. You know, you really don't care if you're just doing a Lean Kaizen event, or you're doing Six Sigma tools, really measure, analyze, improve, control, whatever, but you're really trying to improve that metric. And the proof of the pudding is that 30,000 foot level tracking over time changes to a new enhanced level of performance. And that metric can also be applied to how you're tracking measurements throughout the organization, too. But it just occurred to me that we mentioned 30,000 foot level reporting. And uh, someone, some people on the, on the uh, session here might not be aware of that, that, uh, what that is. And we're going to provide an email address at the end of the uh, session here. So if you want more details about anything that we're talking about, be sure to send us an email, and we'll provide you an article or whatever is appropriate for your particular question. OK, great. Appreciate that. Let's move on to another question is, how many other organizations offering training did you investigate, and what criteria did you use to make your decision? This is, again, another question that we were, uh, people provided before the webinar began. Uh, for, for me in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, I, I did a lot of research prior to this on what was going to be the right fit for, for me and my company to, to invest the, uh, our dollars into. And I felt I had a, a fairly good grasp of the lean side of the house. But for me specifically, uh, statistics is where I fell short. And, and I would venture to say for most people out there, uh, numbers is going to be the area. Uh, lean is, is is quite often a uh, you know can can come down to a plan do check act and uh, you can get a lot of things done by by doing a lot of events but it's the true statistical analysis that uh, for me personally was the the biggest key and uh, whenever my master black belt that we have here uh, took the book off the shelf and quite literally it said Horace Breitvogel you know wrote this book uh, I wanted to go to the guy that wrote the book. And uh, for us, it, it just so happened that uh, we're, we're located in Waco, Texas. And so uh, it did make it a little easier that he was already in Austin. And so for us, uh, it was a no-brainer to go with Smart Solutions. OK, that was great. Appreciate that comment. Any other thoughts on that? We researched a lot of organizations also um, when deciding who to go with. And like Daniel, for, uh, for us, it, I didn't seem to find any. Some offer just lean trainings or just Six Sigma. So I liked the combination lean Six Sigma and the IWE as well. Um, and also for us, like Daniel said, it's a local company for us. So that made it a lot easier for us to accommodate our needs. OK, great. We've got another question that came in. Is, uh, have any of the panelists worked in state government agencies that seem to lack the value of Six Sigma? Uh, yes, uh, I, I did. Uh, prior to this point, I worked in the aerospace industry, uh, specifically for the overhaul and repair of the U-860 Blackhawk. Uh, and so that was a, a government industry. Uh, and yes, it, it, it was very difficult uh, to get um, the, 
the support that we needed, and uh, probably the the best that I could uh, the the best suggestion that I would be able to make to the person asking the question is uh, get the training first, and then after you have the training, you can start to do some projects that uh, get you the most bang for your buck, and so. Uh, Areas that don't have a, a very mature Lean Six Sigma culture, those are the ones that are usually the most ripe for the picking. And so you get a lot of really good low-hanging fruit, and so you might not get a lot of good backing at the beginning, but you usually can find projects that are going to get you a really good return on your investment. And uh, for me, whenever I was working in the government sector, uh, I was able to utilize that low-hanging fruit and go after those projects that, quite frankly, I didn't have to do a whole lot on other than uh, utilize the tools that, that were very easy to do, like 5S and going in and doing a value stream mapping event and uh, a Kaizen event. And next thing I know, we had a, a $2 million savings just by uh, applying the principles and the methodology of Lean Six Sigma properly. And after you can show that kind of return on investment, you know, you, you go in and do a, a project that saves the company $2.5 million, you get attention really quickly. Yeah, I think that's really important is how you can show that information. And I think the 30,000 foot level uh, charting methodology really shows that shift. And also it becomes a means to control the process, too, uh, from a high level point of view. Because sometimes it has a way of drifting back to the old ways. But that's a very good point. So any other thoughts on this? OK, let's move on to the next one. Ideas or advice on how we can change people's mindset so they can see continuous improvement as a as a way of working. Now, this is Brian, and I'll chime in on that one. And that is, uh, and, and it's and it's going to kind of echo what Daniel said. And that is, and I'll just simply say, results. Um, when you get results, whether it's time, whether it's dollars, whether it's throughput, uh, when you demonstrate results. Your advice will you 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 you'll get traction. You'll you'll catch people's attention, and they'll look at what are you doing. Where where did you learn that? And that's really how you can develop this idea of continuous improvement and how that's going to make things better. Uh, demonstrating results uh, almost always comes through. Uh, I've often been in industries where the product life cycle is very short, and so you can get results very quickly with something and then bingo the product's gone <laughs> and so you're not necessarily going to see that but it, but doing it time and time again you'll you'll develop a track record of results and that changes folks minds excellent anybody else have thoughts on that i i just would like to add that definitely results are absolutely important and for us because it's a new a new way of thinking and program um Communicating those results are so important, and making sure that everybody knows. We started giving presentations to the whole division and letting everybody know what our successes are, so that we have more buy-in. Also, yes, it's really important to do that. We, in our master black belt training, we have uh, uh, one of the uh, professors at the University of Texas that he gives a four-hour session on advocacy selling, and he wrote the book on advocacy, John Daly. And uh, uh, it's an excellent uh, session on how, if you've got an idea, how do you sell it to someone else. And these same techniques can be used to go in and convey this information to others throughout the organization. But I suggest you might want to look into the books called Advocacy. Uh, another one is, how long does it take? This is another question that was asked. How long does it take to implement Lean Six Sigma and see uh, return on investment? That's a, that's a really interesting question. Uh, how long does it take to see the implementation of Lean Six Sigma? Well, the, the idea that I have is uh, you can start to implement with something as small as 5S. And it's one of the easiest tools to use. It immediately starts to show uh, a change in an area. You know, sort, straighten, shine, standardize, sustain. When you go in and you just start cleaning house and you start getting rid of things that haven't been used in a long time, uh, that's one of the easiest tools to apply, and it's one of the bare minimal things that you can do as a uh, Lean Six Sigma uh, specialist. 
uh, going in and just cleaning house, literally, uh, and making things better, that, that happens right off the bat. Uh, and then whenever you start to uh, get things uh, organized and get things straightened and get, th get things cleaned up, that's whenever uh, areas of improvement start to show themselves. And uh, these, these ideas for improvement start to pop up, and you're able to say, well, if I make this change over here, we could go twice as fast as we're going right now. Or if we do this over here, not only is it going to save us money, but it's going to increase the safety of this area as well. And so doing small things at the very beginning, uh, you can get that done right out the bat. I mean, uh, w whenever I did my uh, Smart Solutions in September of this last year, I came back and did a 5S event, and they're already starting to see improvements in the area uh, just from that. Uh, and that doesn't even start to go into the statistical analysis of things that, that could go to even make it a better process. And so how quickly can you see results? I would say immediately if you know how to apply the tools properly. And uh, I think uh, Smart Solutions has a good roadmap of how to apply those uh, tools the right way in, in almost any industry. Yeah, I think we can all look at our garage sometimes and see we need to apply 5S or or even in the organization, as someone is saying here, it could be 7S where you're adding safety and security. So those are, those are things that we can do. And it also even applies to like even IT. How long, how much on your, how long have you spent on your computer trying to find a file? You know, and uh, so you could, we can go in and apply that. It may be soft savings, but that has a lot of the benefits. And also we do offer like 5S individualized training so you know we can help you if an or we are, are going to be helping an organization in the very near future actually do some uh, 5s training for themselves so we're not just doing uh, lean six sigma from from our point of view but again I just wanted to emphasize if you got some questions uh, go in and interject those uh, into the uh, you know into your screen and the chat function so uh, we're more than welcome you're more than welcome to uh, interject your questions. Uh, think of most of these questions here. Well, Brian, here got a question for you. For uh, someone that I think you're near your 10th anniversary as a black belt, uh, can you tell the newer belt students what they can expect five or 10 years from now? It all depends upon what gets thrown at them. Um, you know, I've changed industries uh, a couple of times, and the nature of the projects that I get uh, can be very different. Uh, you mentioned software earlier, too. Is there a way to apply 5S or lean to software? And, and there are ways to do that. And, but all of these tools uh, that you learn from Smarter Solutions uh, can have different roadmaps, different techniques, and different ideas. And, and part of what I meant, alluded to earlier, you know, working with people, especially sitting in, folk, in class with folks from other industries, you, you learn to think outside of the box. You learn to model folks from other industries and see, hey, how can this apply? Uh, and it's just a matter of uh, how resourceful are you as a um, as process improvement specialist or expert on being able to look differently at a problem and find some new uh, issues. One of the big things about Kaizen is the idea of continuous improvement, which means that there's always something that can be worked on. There can always be something uh, that can be done. But as you uh, go through the years, at least for me as I've gone through the years, uh, you get thrown new technologies, new uh, problems that people haven't seen before. So how do you do that? And oftentimes, the problems boil down to some fundamental issues which you can be resolved through the training you get through Smarter Solutions. Yeah, I think one of the things that I think is really important is coaching. Like when I'm a mechanical engineer by degree, but the last 12 years I was with IBM from 1980 to 92, I was coached by a, stat, a great statistician that was kind of ahead of his times. And I think that's one thing that's really important to go in and take advantage of coaching and then also having the books if somebody asks me a question I say oh that's similar to maybe on page 375 so it's important to I think have a coach that you can kind of work with over the long haul I got another question here uh, that just came in and says what would you do to accelerate progress in Lean Six Sigma projects so any thoughts out there to accelerate uh, 
to accelerate process. I'm sorry, say it again. Progress. I'm, I may oh. have not said it correctly. What would you do to accelerate progress in Lean Six Sigma projects? Gotcha. Okay. Well, for me personally, and and I don't want to divert away from the question, but we try to do the best that we can to not speed through the process. Uh, I think there is something to be said for taking it stepwise and you know defining the problem, make the, because. If you immediately jump to the measure stage or immediately jump to trying to analyze and, and you think you know what the answer is to the problem, too often if you don't take the time to truly identify, you know, do something like a, a team charter or do something like uh, that, that true define phase, making sure that you really understand why are we trying to attack this problem. Uh, I, I, I appreciate the question because that, that, is, that is the truth with uh, the way the industry is, we want to get to the answer, we want to get to the solution as quickly as possible, but my only uh, a caveat to that would be don't overlook the small things that some people would think, uh, you know, we need to, we, I know what the answer is to this, I know how to solve this problem, I'm going to jump directly into it, and, and, we're, and this is how we're going to do it. So what your, pro, what, what your project will be is this is the solution, now go make, go do this. And my only caveat to that would be if you've truly done the define phase and you truly understand where you are once you've measured and you have truly identified what the root cause is, then you can try to progress as quickly as you can through the improved phase to try to implement and get your, uh, uh, your true solution put into place. Uh, but I would, I would uh, cautiously uh, say be very careful not to just jump directly into the improve phase without making sure you've truly identified what the problem is, why you're there, and did you truly identify the true root cause before jumping to a, uh, to a conclusion. Yeah, and I think that that's a very good rigor to the whole thing. Uh, but I, I suggest sometimes people want to jump to a solution, and if you've got a good 30,000 foot level, how are you performing? And I'll say, okay, if you can do this very quickly, Let's go in and do it, and we can make it go back. And if it really made a real big improvement, then the thing is we're done, maybe. Kaizen events over a couple of days or something. But, but a lot of times what happened, and I think this is consistent with Daniel said, we think we got the solution, but in reality it didn't really make any difference. And if you start out with the, a good tracking of, at the 30,000 foot level, how you're performing, then it becomes saying, whoa, well, I guess I was kind of jumping the gun there and it didn't make any difference. So that's a very good, very good point here. Got another this, question. This. This is Brian. I want to I want to That's throw going. in my That's two true. cents on that last one. Uh, I want to I want to answer that question in two ways, and they're kind of dichotomous in in the sense that uh, I want to agree with Daniel in the sense that I encourage folks to spend their time in the analyze phase, and not to jump into the results or the action phase until you've done your analysis uh, completely. Uh, I know a project where we spent of the eight months we spent on the project, we spent five on the analysis, and, and in three months we had outstanding results because we took the five months of doing an analysis and stepping through that. And so that we want to make sure that what we're doing is right and then you've got that. So if you're looking for that quick result or that quick buck, oftentimes you can run into uh, some, some issues. If you are indeed looking to accelerate the program, kind of show some progress. If you need to show some results real quickly, much like Daniel and Vanessa said, there's some low-hanging fruit out there. Go pick those and show some stuff. 5S is a wonderful way of doing that. You can, when you clean house doing a, a 5S project, suddenly you're you're, you're going to lift people's spirits, and you're going to there's visibly some things that you can you can put into place. Put some visual management uh, tools in place and post some of the metrics that people are important uh, to them. And let them know. So if you want to, if you want a quick turnaround, you really want to accelerate some stuff. Do those visual things. Do those things that are going to make you just pick the low-hanging fruit. Do a 5S. But then, as they mentioned too, take your time on the stuff that's going to cost you the money, and make sure that you're doing the right analysis. Because if your metrics don't show the improvement, you're going to lose your battle. Yeah, I think that's excellent point. There's another point, another twist, or another thing that I think is important is also get the, the process owner involved that we're really working on improving one of their metrics so it doesn't fall off of people's plates. A lot of times that's what creates the longevity 
of a project is it falls off of people's plates because the process owner is not asking for it to get done. So again, if you can tie that project to a metric that's important to the business and the process owner is asking for it to get done because they're going to report to their boss's boss, then I think that you have an acceleration accelerant for that particular project. Here's, a, here's another question. I think this may be time for the final one. I don't know. We'll see. But, uh, are Six Sigma concepts aligned? Well, no, I got a couple more here. What is the best way to capture soft dollar savings and lean Six Sigma projects? Have anybody got thoughts on that? This is Brian. In my experience, um, a lot of uh, times you, it's hard to tie some of the things you do. I run into the situation too where, you, hey, we saved you know, $5 million on this project, show me the dollars, right? And, uh, and unless you're in a position where you've tied it to a metric specifically, you can do that. Uh, but many times we have cases of, look, we've, got, we've reduced overtime by a substantial amount. I run projects where the team has not had mandatory overtime in nine months and now they've got this. Uh, so there's, those are some things. So oftentimes you want to, you can pull in successes from soft savings uh, through people's attitudes and through uh, other things that, uh, uh, that are visual or just kind of lift and upbeat and 5S is a good way to do that as I mentioned earlier. But uh, just kind of getting people on board and making sure that they understand this is what's going on. A lot of times those soft savings can be brought through uh, kind of a better feeling about the organization, about what's going on, because you know you're working towards making things better. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a very good point because I, I like to actually look at uh, these, some of these projects could maybe change the policies of how we're running the business. You know, hey, maybe it's the compensations for uh, we're at the end of the quarter. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, sales really increased because of the compensation process we have for the sales force are meeting their quarterly numbers, and it breaks the back of manufacturing, for example. You know, so we can uh, and those somewhat may be soft, but then also they get to be hard too when you're looking at it. So. Uh, what about uh, another question came in? Are Six Sigma because we got a, a, still another eight minutes or so here? Are Six Sigma so? If you got any other questions, just uh, uh, go in and uh, put those into your chat function here. Are Six Sigma concepts aligned with Agile methodology, Scrum process, Kanban, our our Kanban, Kanban process? What are your thoughts? Are Six Sigma methodologies aligned with con with the Kanban process? The Kanban, but for also agile uh, software development methodologies. This is Brian, and uh, haven't worked in the software realm a bit. Um, agile is um, still somewhat new to some organizations. Others have been doing it for a long time. But if you have the IEEE training. Uh, from Smarter Solutions, you're going to see a benefit to going the Agile route. And, and as, as I've discussed this with many software people before, uh, defining Agile for your organization can be tricky because it's not a textbook thing because uh, it varies depending on how your software release cycles are set up, for example, etc. But understanding how your team is, is working, what metrics are they driving to, those all align really well to a good Lean Six Sigma function. Uh, and in, in driven uh, their activities and how these people get involved with that, and especially if they're involved with how the metrics are defined and such, and then held accountable to that, which is a big part of Agile, right? Keeping accountability and responsibility. And if it's, if it's all there, then all of this aligns really well, uh, depending upon which tools you're using and, and what your approach is. Yeah, I look at Agile as kind of a process improvement project for software, so it's kind of a quick plan to check act process as you're going through the overall uh, development process of the software as opposed to the waterfall, because you're never quite as smart enough uh, to define every requirement that you might need for that software process here. Oh, we've got another question. Someone was talking about Six Sigma levels before and after process improvement efforts for a given process or industry. I'm not 
I'm going to take a shot at that one. I'm not really a big fan of sigma quality levels. Like if you're a six sigma organization, five or four, a lot of times those numbers can be gamed. And that's the reason I suggest that the 30,000 foot level farmer reporting uh, is a better way of actually looking at how a process or organization is performing. Uh, another question we have in here, is, is there a master black belt at each of your places of work, or do you think that they should be? I can tell you from my experience, uh, the more people that you have that are champions for Lean Six Sigma and uh, that kind of methodology, it's just going to make your job that much easier. Uh, whether that be a master black belt, a team of green belts, uh, a, a you know a black belt in, in ourselves, uh, or even even training up uh, the very basic yellow belt. Uh, the more people that you have that are champions for your cause, it's just going to make it better for you. And and I can tell you, uh, the master black belt that I had here on site, uh, his input and his insight was invaluable to my learning and my uh, development in the Lean Six Sigma methodology. Yeah, Vanessa, what are your thoughts about that? I think uh, I would love to have a master black belt in our organization. We currently have yellow belts, green belts, and black belts going through their projects, and it would be really great to have a master black belt. Yeah, I think that's, that's something an organization can grow into. So if you've got somebody that would like to do that, then they could utilize an external master black belt and coach them along and take the training and so on. Like we have for the master black belt training, which is a little different than most organizations. It's two weeks over two months, where the first uh, week is dealing with this 30,000 foot level reporting and also the business side of it. We've got a, a book that talks about all that and nine step process. And then the second week gets more technical uh, uh, tools for the uh, domain process. And but the, the idea behind that, then you can go in and start communicating with uh, uh, someone. And so basically, I'm coaching one of our uh, past students. I got a conference call on Monday with them, for example. And so now you can start coaching them along. And then later with the books, they can end up working with, uh, then they can be doing the coaching for their black belts and green belts. So to me, it's a growth process. And that's one of the things that I think a lot of time is often overlooked is we don't really take advantage of the coaching as much as we should. Because I think we all need to have mentors of some form or fashion. And I'll chime in on that too in the sense that once again, the, the more you communicate with folks that uh, understand the methodology, the, the better you're going to be able to work through your issues and challenges. The more you can bounce somebody off of a coach or a master black belt within your organization, you know, especially if you want to take a, an issue to senior management, you know, they're not grasping this. If they can rely on that master black belt or that master black belt coach, then then it's they'll, they'll feel much more comfortable about the approach that they're taking to resolve an issue or to take on a new challenge of reducing costs by X percent, et cetera. Okay, that's great. Uh, so uh, looks like we're about to the end of our hour allotment here. Uh, is there any other final thoughts by the any of the panelists? Oh, this is Brian, and I'll just chime in once again that I encourage folks that uh, if you're considering it, please take the opportunity because no matter how you approach a problem you, you have at work or that you've been assigned, if you're you know, an engineer, for example, on this, um, there's a tool within this toolbox that you're going to be able to use to <clears throat> get the results that you're looking for. And so I really encourage folks to get in touch with Smarter Solutions and find out how they can learn about all these tools and all that's available. Okay, great. Well, as, as I mentioned here, um, we covered a lot of ground, and we do have also uh, uh, we, we got some resources that's out there. We've got like over 300 uh, different articles, recorded webinars, and so on uh, that that's available. We have uh, uh, public training. We do on-site training also as well. And if you uh, uh, want us to go in and send you some links to this kind of information, just be free, uh, feel free to go in and send something to uh, info at smartersolutions.com 
And also, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to go in and, and send us uh, uh, that, that question either through email or give us a buzz. So again, I really want to thank uh, our, our panelists. I think they did a great job, and I appreciate uh, that. And also the excellent questions that we've had from all our participants in this webinar. So I wish you guys to have a great of the rest of the day. And uh, some of you are not as warm as we are. Brian's real <laughs> cold up north. But uh, we're in, not too bad here down in the south end of the United States. So uh, again, have a great day and uh, remainder of the week.